All right, if you would this morning, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. And uh, we're doing a series of messages. Uh, Mary asked me what the title of the message was, and I can't ever, usually I can't come up with a good title, but the, the whole series of messages is centered around simply the Word of God and the importance of the Word of God in our life. And the first message I did on this was on submission and the idea of submitting ourselves to the Word of God. You see, it's one thing to believe that we have the book, that we have before us the Word of God. Now, let me say to those that have just tuned in on the Internet that we're glad to have you. And any time I mention that we're doing a series of messages, the messages that came before are on our website. They're also on our Facebook, uh, should be. Uh, or you can go to our YouTube channel, which is Steve Atwood, and they're there. So there's several ways you can listen to them. And we do appreciate you, you listening over the Internet. But this series of messages that we're doing, uh, it really is the importance of the Word of God but there are factors about that that we need to understand and embrace in our life. For example, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, a verse we're all extremely familiar with, is, says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now the first message we did, we emphasized Hebrews chapter 4. And that is that God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder of the joints and marrows, the center of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so we, we know that we have the word of God. We know that it's alive. It has the ability to quicken, uh, to enlighten, to instruct, uh, to empower us. But... If we do not use the Word of God properly, if we do not handle the Word of God properly, it will be of none effect in our life. It will have no effect on our life. And so the second message that we did, I simply titled 2 Timothy 2.15, Revisited. Because there are those that, that view dispensationalism as resting upon the foundation of this one verse. And as I try to point out over and over, if this verse was not in the Bible, it would not change anything about dispensational truth. Somebody says, well, what are the foundational verses? I, I was thinking about that this morning, about 4 o'clock, laying in the bed trying to go back to sleep. And uh, I thought about how Paul says in Romans that he's the apostle of the Gentiles. In Corinthians, he says, be ye followers of me. He time and again mentions my gospel. And then he says that the dispensation of the grace of God was committed unto him to usward. So there's a lot of, I mean, numerous verses in Romans through Philemon that show us, whoa, I don't know why I even fooled with that. Jason, you messed that up. <laughs> we'll get it. There we go. There, there are numerous verses in Paul's epistles that you could say are foundational verses for dispensational truth. But 2 Timothy 2.15, we could say is a foundational verse, but... There's so much more to that than simply the phrase rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's my point. For example, the first word, study. The word of God will not have an impact upon your life or it will not have as much impact on your life if you fail to study. Now you can come to church, you can come to Sunday school, you can listen to tapes, watch YouTube, but there needs to be personal study. And then he said that the reason that's important is that we want to be able to show ourselves approved unto God. 
And we mentioned that in relation to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the judgment seat of Christ. A workman, that's what we're to be doing. There's work to be done that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And some translations have that correctly handling. Instead of study, they put be diligent. Well, you know, even if you use one of those translations, those things that are said about the Word of God there are things that we would want to do. We should be diligent. But that doesn't replace study. And we should rightly divide the Word of Truth, and they replace that with correctly handling the Word of Truth. And we, certainly we want to do that. But the fact is, is that the verse within itself tells us the importance of study. Now, I don't care what subject you're talking about. If you're going to be knowledgeable of that subject, whether it's in the secular world or concerning Christianity, if you don't study, you're going to be ignorant of that particular subject. I referenced many times the training program I went through when I went to work for McKesson Robbins Drug Company. McKesson's was sort of the Amazon of drug stores back in the 70s. In that uh, back then you had all these local drug stores. Some of you that lived here for years will remember Lee Pharmacy down on Broad Street and Neighbors Drug Store over on Brainerd Road and all these different pharmacies. And what we did as a wholesale company we sold to that drugstore everything that they sold. We were a wholesaler, and including the drugs and the narcotics. So I like to tell people I started my career in Chattanooga as a drug seller, uh, and I did. But the training program for that job, when I took the job in Birmingham, was a year long. And I thought, what is it that could take so long about learning this job that it would take a year, eight hours a day, five days a week. But I found out that what they wanted me to do is they wanted me to know the company operation from top to bottom. So I started out on the receiving deck where they brought the shipments in. And I had to unload those things and then I had to go through a, a time when I worked in distribution. We would bring the drugs in, we would stock the shelves, and then we had what they call pickers. And those, if there, it was A through C, then this person had long shelves, and they went down and they would put it in the basket, and that basket was on a roller, and it'd go all the way around and come back, and at the end it's supposed to have everything in there that they had ordered. And so I had to do that. Then I had to work in the credit office. Then I had to work in the business office. Then I had to work out in the field with salesmen. And then I had to learn the generic names for the most common drugs of the time. So I would know how to write an order. Turns out that last part it didn't benefit me a great at McKesson, but it got me a job at Blue Cross in the pharmacy audit department. The point is, folks, is that they wanted me to be knowledgeable, and that didn't come just through reading the manual. It came through studying and learning and working. And I think about that in relation to the life of a Christian. I mean, I grew up in a church. And we had Sunday school and church. And in Sunday school, we used what was called a quarterly. Every quarter, the association would send out a book. And you'd use that book. Then in Sunday morning service, the preacher would usually read one verse, close his Bible, and he would tell a lot of stories. And it was very entertaining. As a matter of fact, after Sunday school, the common practice was to take your Bible and put it in the car because you weren't going to need it in church. And I'm serious. You'd see the line of people going out there putting their Bible in the car because they used it in Sunday school. I mean, they turned to three or four verses. And uh, 
Then there was training union. Any of y'all remember training union? First time I ever visited the church down here. What, what's the name of Big Baptist Church? Stuart Heights. First night I visited there, me and Mary. They, we were having a discussion. We were talking to each other, and they found out that I'd been a been preaching son. And they said, "Well, our teacher's not here tonight. How about you teaching us?" I said, "What?" They said, "Well, here's the here's the training union quarterly. You know what the subject was on? Taking care of the environment. That was the title." And I stood up and I said. I don't know nothing about the environment. How about we just have a Bible study? And I didn't know anything about the Bible then, but I read some verses in Matthew and got on with teaching them about how that they ought to follow the Sermon on the Mount, so forth. And about six weeks later, I visited this church. And the rest is history. I found out that there was a book called the King James Bible. And I had some men show me that it was the Word of God. Verse by verse, compared it with the Bible I was using, the good news for modern man. Right? It, hadn't been, it wasn't long after that that I got saved. i had already been preaching seven years, and I got saved, and I came to understand the difference in Paul's epistles and the rest of the Bible. And that lit a fire in me to study and to equip myself with the information that I could give to other people. And it changed my life. Uh, before I understood the word rightly divided, we were, in the Baptist church I was a part of, we had Thursday night visitation. And some of you have heard this, but there's always new people listening. And I was there every Thursday night as a young man, and I would go out with one of the older men. And uh, one was Thursday night. It just turned out there was two of us young people there, and so they sent us out. And so we went up to a door, and we knocked on the door, and I'm standing back like this, and I'm just praying, Lord, don't let anybody answer the door. I was scared. I thought, what am I going to do if they ask me a question? I knew I didn't have any answers. But they didn't ask me many, any Bible questions. It, what we were there was to try to get them in church. As a matter of fact, our term was, you know, if there's in this community five or six hundred families that are unchurched. Nothing about unsaved, unchurched. Uh, and then once I learned about rightly dividing the word of truth and I would go visiting, generally me and Brother Doug Bettingfield would be teamed up in visitation and I was just waiting and hoping for somebody to ask a question. Because I knew I had the answer. And it wasn't me, it was the Word of God. And so Paul encourages us to study. And then he says to the Corinthians, look over 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Now, the context of 1 Corinthians 14, tell you what, before we read there, look in chapter 12, verse 1, because this is the context of chapter 12, 13, and 14 is Paul's correction about spiritual gifts. And he says there in chapter 12, verse 1, Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Do you think today that there are people that are ignorant about spiritual gifts? The majority of the religious world is ignorant of spiritual gifts. I'm fixing to get off on a rabbit trail there, so let's just look over chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Paul has gone through three chapters there about the spiritual gifts and the misuse of tongues and all that. And he says in verse 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, 
Let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now, you know, I think about that, and every person today that's involved with spiritual gifts, if they would take heed to verse 37, in other words, if they think they're spiritual because they've got some gift that nobody else has, or they have the favor of God on them that other people don't have, he says, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are, what? The commandments of the Lord. Not Paul's opinions, not Paul's theory, not Paul's supposition. He said, the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And then the next verse he says, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Now, there are several times that Paul mentions things that we should not be ignorant about. Amen. And the first use of the word in the book is in, uh, the, as far as Paul's usage, is in Romans chapter 1. In verse 13, he said, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you, also even as among other Gentiles. So we see the usage of the word there. But in relation to doctrine, there are seven doctrinal issues that Paul addresses where he says, you shouldn't be ignorant. You don't want to be ignorant of. Look to Romans chapter 10. We read this verse last week and concluded with it. And I said that we would finish addressing it this morning. In Romans chapter 10, in verse 1, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So what were they ignorant of? They were ignorant of God's righteousness. Why? Because they did not do what Paul said, like when he wrote to Timothy, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. They did not acknowledge that the things that Paul wrote unto them were the commandments of the Lord. I mean, come on, folks. In the book of Acts, every city Paul went to, where was the first place he preached? In the synagogue. He told the Jews that this man, Christ Jesus, is the Messiah. He was crucified. He was buried. He was raised again the third day. And if they would listen to that, he would go on and share with them the truth of what he accomplished, the gospel. He told the Corinthians, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to scriptures. In spite of all of his efforts, in spite of all the twelve had done to try to bring uh, Israel to uh, being converted, they were still ignorant of God's righteousness. And so what were they doing? They were doing exactly what the religious world does today. They were going about to establish their own righteousness. A righteousness that is built upon the works of the flesh rather than the truth of the word of God. If any man be ignorant, he says let him be ignorant. He says in verse 3, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Praise God for that. Jesus Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believeth. Now, turn with me, if you will, over to Philippians chapter 3. I want us to look at some things concerning the righteousness of God. And hopefully we'll see through these things, these, these verses, 
why there is still this ignorance of God's righteousness. Not just among Israel, but among most of religion today. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath wherefore he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now then, that tells me, which goes against what a lot of people teach today, that there was a righteousness that was associated with the law. It was not imputed righteousness. They were not made righteous. But Israel was counted righteous by obedience to the law, by their faith in God and so forth. But Paul says there in verse 7, what things were down, gained to me. All those things he just mentioned, they were gained to him. He said, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. So that was a man-made righteousness Paul is talking about. His own righteousness. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's the righteousness we have today when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. We've been made righteous. Uh, now, look back to Luke chapter 1. Paul mentions the righteousness which is of the law. There is a teaching today that is prevalent among quite a few grace preachers, and I differ with this, and I wouldn't, sure wouldn't divide over the issue such as this. But the idea is, is that people have always been saved by grace through faith throughout the Bible. Well, obviously, I know that nobody was ever saved by keeping the law. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, obviously, faith was always a requisite for salvation, for uh, being in the favor of God and so forth. But there's an awful lot of error taught about Old Testament salvation because people do not acknowledge, I'm going to kind of go on a limb here, people in the Old Testament were not saved. They didn't have salvation. They were looking forward to being saved. Peter said, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When? When the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So, what does that tell me? That tells me that their sins were not yet blotted out then if their sins weren't blotted out, they weren't saved in the sense that we talk about salvation today, and that's why there's so much confusion about this issue. How are people, I've had the question at least a hundred times, how are people in the Old Testament saved? They weren't. <laughs> they were preserved unto salvation if they believed God had faith, but according to the book of Leviticus, I think it's like 30-something times the book of Leviticus mentions people being cut off Man. from the people. 
People say, well, that's just their physical blessings. No, when they were cut off from the people, the Bible said salvation is of the Jew. When they lost their standing with the nation, they were, they were done for. Unless they repented, brought a sacrifice, and so forth. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments of the ordinances of the Lord blameless. Well, then there was a righteousness that was associated with obedience to the Lord. And those that were not obedient ended up being cut off. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments. But Paul said, that's not the righteousness that he had. He said, he is touching the law, he was blameless. Well, what happened? Look over in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And I've never really heard anybody explain these verses that believes that people in the Old Testament were saved like we are today. In Galatians chapter 3, look there in verse... Uh, Well, let's see. Look in verse 19. Wherefore then, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could, get, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to him that believed. But be, now notice the phrase here. But before faith came, Whoa. Before faith came? Hmm. Well, you go over and read Hebrews chapter 11, that kind of poses a problem. <laughs> by faith. By faith. By faith. So the faith he's talking about here is something a little bit different. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Then there was a faith that was going to be revealed that was not revealed by the law. Verse 24, wherefore, here it is, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Hold on here, we're going to come right back and look in Romans chapter 3. What does a schoolmaster do? A schoolmaster teaches. What do the recipients of the teaching have? They have understanding and are not in ignorance. In Romans chapter 3, Verse 19, Paul says, Now we know what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And notice the next two words. But now, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the righteousness of God 
was not manifested by the law. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, and the law was given that all the world may become guilty before God. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Well, then there must have been a righteousness of God before, and there was. The righteousness of the law that was mentioned there in Luke chapter 1, that Paul mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 6. This shall be our righteousness, he said. Now, back in Galatians chapter 3, Wherefore, verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You see, faith is what you believe. Look back in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. I mean, you start telling people about salvation by grace through faith, and they thought, oh, Abraham was saved by faith. Yeah, but what did Abraham believe? Look in verse 1. What shall we say then? That our Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh, is found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God... And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Well, what did Abraham believe? He believed what God told him. He said, I'm going to make of thee a great nation. And because Abraham believed God, it was counted to him. Abraham was not made righteous. He was counted righteous. It was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We don't have any proof that Abraham was looking forward to Jesus Christ coming and dying for the sins of the world. Abraham believed whatever God told him at the moment. And God counted that for righteousness. Well, you know what? In that sense, it's the same today. The difference is, what do we believe for righteousness? We believe in imputed righteousness. We believe that we've been made righteous. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us. God made Christ to be sin for us. Last statement, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He didn't say that we might become righteous. He said that we might be made the righteousness of God. Think about that, folks. He said earlier there, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. People have the idea that that new creature is a person who turns over a new leaf and quits doing bad things, start going to church, all that kind of stuff. No, a righteous person is a person that has trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And God made us righteous and He said that we've been accepted in the blood. That's the imputed 
righteousness that we have today. And the religious world, by and large, is ignorant of that. Anybody that preaches baptismal regeneration is ignorant of God's righteousness today. Any person that tells you you've got to do works in order to be saved or maintain salvation is preaching works and they're ignorant of God's righteousness. Anybody that tells you that if you don't worship on Saturday, you've got the mark of the beast, they are ignorant of God's righteousness. And that's exactly what Israel's problem was. They were so steeped uh, and wrapped up in the law that they were just bound, bent, and determined to believe that keeping that law was going to find them favor with God. And Paul said, no way. You're talking about a time now where it's by faith. And it's by the faith of Jesus Christ. Look over back in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5. Look in verse 12. Wherefore is by one man sinner in the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. The idea being there that the sentence of death was passed upon mankind by Adam, and whether they sinned or didn't sin wasn't the issue. They were going to die. And so he says in verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For through the offense of one, Many be dead. Who was that? Adam. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, who hath abounded unto many. I like to put it like this. What Adam messed up, Christ fixed. <laughs> Christ made it possible for all men to be saved and be removed from the curse of Adam into the blessing of salvation, the blessing of Christ. Verse 16, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment by, was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, Adam. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift, now notice this phrase, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That's Adam. Even so by the righteousness of one, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Amen. You see, folks, it has nothing to do with your obedience other than obeying the gospel. One man disobeyed. It brought condemnation. One man was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And it brought salvation. It brought righteousness, if you will. And most of the religious world today has people all wrapped up in trying to do enough to be righteous. Thank God the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're righteous. You've been made righteous in Christ Jesus. We were talking this morning about that thing of righteousness and Richard was saying that when he first, when first he had just started coming here and 
Brother Jerry Lockhart came in one Sunday morning and Richard said, well, how are you doing, Jerry? And Jerry said, I'm as righteous as Jesus Christ. Richard was kind of taken back by that. I told him I did the same thing on the elevator at Blue Cross and there was more than one taken back by that. But the fact is, folks, that's not bragging on ourselves. It's bragging on the position that we have in God by Jesus Christ. And thank God we have His righteousness. Because the book says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Can't you imagine people standing before God and He asks them, and just, this is just not Bible. This is a thing of the way I see things. Man standing before God and God says, by what merit do you gain entrance into heaven? And the individual says, well, I joined the church when I was such and such and I got baptized and I became a deacon and I taught Sunday school and I served on the committee and I visited every week and on and on it goes and he thinks, boy, the rewards are just piling up and he looks down and there's a big old pile of filthy rags. And I like what old J. Vernon McGee used to say on the radio. If he ever was in that situation and God said, by what merit... Do you gain heaven? He said, all I could do is look straight into his face and say, I'm only here because of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm only here because of what he did in my behalf. Amen. All of our righteousness are filthy rags. Don't be ignorant of God's righteousness. Don't believe that there's something you can do in your flesh that will cause you to find favor with God over other people. Don't believe that there's something you can perform that will make you acceptable to God. The only thing you can do is trust in the sacrifice that God provided through His Son, Jesus Christ. When He died for our sins, He was buried and He was raised again the third day. And when you receive that as a free gift, you believe that gospel and you receive the free gift of salvation, that moment you're made righteous and you're accepted in the blood and you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Folks, if there's anything that ought to make us almost Pentecostal are the truths that we've talked about this morning. The fact of all that we have in Christ in spite of all that we are in our flesh. We don't deserve it. We didn't merit it. We got it as a free gift Amen. by His grace. Thank God for that. Paul said, because they are ignorant of God's righteousness, they are going about to establish their own righteousness. And I believe that's the majority of religious people today in a system where works is prevalent and there are those that teach works for salvation or they have tell you you're saved by grace but in order to keep it you've got to do certain works. Either way, they're denying the grace of God and the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Would you stand me for prayer? I saw Joyce out there fanning. She wasn't the only one that was hot. <laughs> hard, hard to decide whether to throw on the air conditioner or the heater in the morning. Father, we thank you today for this opportunity that we've had to study your word. We thank you for the wonderful truths of your word, the blessing of salvation, the blessing of knowing the truth. Help us, Lord, that we would not be ignorant of all that you say to us and that we would study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if there's anybody listening that's never been saved, I pray at this very moment they would receive the free gift of salvation for Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you for being here today. We're, we're dismissed.